subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number 12 of Surah At-Tawbah, he says, but if they break their oath after having made, after having them made a treaty with you, but if they break their oath after having made their treaty and vilify your religion, then fight the, the leaders of disbelief. Truly they have no oaths so that they may desist. Now, we know that the Holy Prophet ﷺ, in addition to being a prophet and a messenger, he was also the head of state. So the prophet is unique, and one of the things that distinguishes him from most prophets is that the Holy Prophet actually had political power. Many prophets throughout history, the majority of prophets, were not the heads of state. They were not rulers of government. They were not government, they did not have political power. The Holy Prophet ﷺ, when he migrated from Mecca to Medina, he established an Islamic state. So he wasn't just the, a leader and a guide when it came to spiritual affairs. He was also seen as the head of state and the commander in chief. And therefore the Holy Prophet in this verse is given in, in this surah is given instructions on how to deal with high treason. You know, if you look at the the biographies of prophets like Yahya and Isa السلام, and even Ibrahim, you find that the vast majority of prophets did not occupy political positions, meaning that they were never afforded the opportunity to lead a government or to lead a country or to lead a state. So you see that the Prophet is given instructions on how to deal with his enemies. And this is why you find that individuals like Isa السلام, is idolized in the world because it's very easy to be idealistic when you speak about Isa السلام, because he didn't have any political power. He was not married. He was not the head of state. He never had to deal with you know, military conflicts. He did not have to deal with war prisoners or high treason. Whereas the Holy Prophet was unique in the fact that in addition to his nubuwa, he was also the head of state. He had a government that he was running. He had enemies, he had military expeditions, and he had to deal with the treachery of his enemies. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number 12, he continues the discussion on the conditions of war because the verses have given permission to the Holy Prophet to declare war on the different tribes who have breached their treaties. So Allah says, وَإِن نَكَثُوا أَيْمَانَهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ عَهْدِهِمْ وَطَعَنُوا فِي دِينِكُمْ فَقَاتِلُوا أَئِمَّةَ الْكُرْفِ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is establishing the justification for war. That you have individuals who are living in the Islamic State, who are living in territory that is controlled by the Muslims. They have enacted treaty agreements with the Holy Prophet. And after a short period of time, they broke their oaths. They violated the terms of their treaty. And in addition to that, this is not just a matter of, you know, they didn't live up to certain agreements in a treaty. That these individuals who broke their pledges with the Prophet, not only did they violate the terms of the treaty, that these are not simple infractions, these are not simple violations, these are individuals that are vilifying your religion. So by signing this agreement, they had initially agreed to peacefully coexist, to not interfere, to not harass the Muslims. But even after 
they enacted these treaty agreements, you find that they are actively vilifying the Muslim community. They are creating a hostile environment, an, an Islamic, an Islamophobic environment, if we want to use modern terms. So they're essentially dehumanizing the Muslims. They're justifying the persecution and the killing of Muslims. وَإِن نَكَثُوا أَيْمَانَهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ عَهْدِهِمْ وَطَعَنُوا فِي دِينِكُمْ Because the treaty has been violated and because these individuals are vilifying your religion, what does Allah say? Permission is given to fight. Because you have a right to defend yourself against religious persecution. You have Muslims who are being killed solely because they're Muslims. But interestingly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells the Prophet and He tells the Muslims by extension to fight not just anybody, but to fight the leaders of disbelief. You see, brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to make it very clear that your enemies are the leaders of disbelief. They are the ones who are creating this atmosphere of religious intolerance. Your, enemy, your real enemies are not the ignorant ones. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is essentially telling the Prophet that many of the kuffar, many of the mushrikeen, they're ignorant. They are not your real enemies. In Islam, we, do not, we don't fight the ignorant. We don't punish the ignorant. We educate the ignorant. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that our conflict is not with the ignorant, it's with the leaders of disbelief. A'immat al kuf And one of the unfortunate consequences is that the ignorant people are swayed and they become participants in this war. So fighting the ignorant disbelievers is an unfortunate consequence of fighting a'immat al kuf So the Prophet sallallahu his objective is not to just fight these random people, these, these, the ignorant. He wants to fight, you know, the individuals like Abu Sufyan. He wants to fight the likes of, you know, uh, the, the heads of the, uh, the movement. فَقَاتِلُوا أَئِمَّةَ الْكُفْ إِنَّهُمْ لَا أَيْمَانَ لَهُمْ That they have no oaths. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes أَئِمَّةَ الْكُفْ the leaders of disbelief, He says, truly they have no oaths. Meaning, they have no commitment to any pledge. These are not people that can be trusted. Now, Ideally, the Holy Prophet ﷺ was trying to live. He wanted to coexist with all of these different people. In Medina and in Mecca, there were Jews and there were Christians, and the Prophet even allowed the mushrikeen to live. But they refused to honor their social con uh, contract. And this goes to show you, brothers and sisters, that when you want to eliminate any evil, you have to go to the source. You have to eliminate the ideology. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet to fight the leaders of disbelief, to fight the individuals that have created this hostile environment, the individuals that are perpetuating an ideology that dehumanizes Muslims. Fight those people. Fight these individuals who who have established this ideology, not the ignorant ones who are victims of propaganda. So fighting the ignorant disbelievers is just an unfortunate consequence that the Prophet is not intending on fighting them. They just happen to be in the battlefield. They happen to be persuaded to fight. But the real enemies, meaning that if the Prophet is able to defeat he doesn't care about the others. If the heads of the leaders of disbelief are eliminated, then the objective 
is met. The goal is met. In the next ayah, so again, so ayah number 12 is establishing, it's continuing the discussion on the justification for war. In the next verse, in ayah number 13, Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns his attention to the believers who are reluctant to fight. As I mentioned in our last session, there are many Orientalists when they write about the history of Arabs during Jahiliya, when they write about the early history of Islam, they portray the Arabs as individuals who are who have a natural inclination towards violence. They're barbaric people. These are individuals that are ruthless. They are violent by nature. And the reason why the Prophet succeeded in Arabia is he was able to direct their violence and their aggression towards external enemies, that he united the Arabs. So instead of fighting each other, he took individuals who were who had a violent and aggressive nature, and he basically united them to fight external enemies. But you find that this is not true, that it, it's an unfair characterization to say that the Arabs always yearned for war. They were always thirsty for bloodshed. In this ayah, you see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to motivate the mu'mineen to fight. And many of them were Arabs. If Arabs loved war, why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala verse after verse convincing them that they have to fight? It's because many of them did not want to fight. They wanted peace. Because they were comfortable now in Medina. They had, they've accumulated wealth. You know, they have wives, they have children. They just want to live. But peace can only exist Peace has its prerequisites. You can only have peace when there's justice. When you eliminate persecution. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses those believers who are reluctant to fight. He says, أَلَا تُقَاتِلُونَ قَوْمًا نَكَثُوا أَيْمَانَهُمْ وَهَمُّوا بِإِخْرَاجِ الرَّسُولِ وَهُمْ بَدَأُوكُمْ أَوَّلَ مَرَّةٍ أَتَخْشَوْنَهُمْ فَاللَّهُ أَحَقُّ أَنْ تَخْشَوْهُ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ So Allah addresses the believers who are hesitant to fight, who don't want to go to the battlefield. They want to stay at home. They want peace. Allah says, will you not fight a people who broke their oaths? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to list three justifications for war. Why the believers have to go and fight. Why they should be motivated to go and defend themselves in the battlefield. Allah says, will you not, will you not fight a people who broke their oaths and intended to expel the messenger? and opened hostility against you first. They attacked you first. Do you fear them? Allah is asking the mu'mineen. Do you fear the mushrikeen? Are you afraid? Fear God. He is worthier of being feared by you if you are believers. So again, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives three justifications for war. To the believers he says number one they broke their treaty with you they had made a commitment that they would not attack you that there would be 10 years of peace according to the treaty of hudaybiyah for example which was enacted in the sixth year after the hijrah they had they had agreed that there would be peace for 10 years that they would not attack you and they would not form coalitions with your enemies, but they broke their treaty with you, number one. Number two, Have you forgotten that they were the ones 
who drove Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi out of Mecca. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi in the last three years in Mecca, he was essentially homeless. He was living in the cave hideout of Abu Talib, Shi'ab Abi Talib. He was boycotted. The Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he even himself, he says, there were many days that me and Bilal were so hungry, his companion Bilal, we were so hungry that we would go and we would gather plants, any vegetation that was grown from the earth, and that's what we would eat. That's what our food would be. The Prophet lost his uncle, his wife. And after the death of his uncle Abu Talib, Quraysh was emboldened. Now the Prophet had no protector. They plotted to assassinate the messenger. And they essentially drove him out of his birthplace. The Prophet loved Mecca. You know when the Prophet was leaving Mecca, when he was migrating, when he was driven out, as he was leaving Mecca, he stood and he looked down to the valley of Mecca because Mecca is a valley. And tears started to stream down his cheeks. Can you imagine how difficult it is that this is the city that you grew up in. This is Baytullah. It's the most sacred city in the world. And you're being driven out. So Rasulullah addresses the city of Mecca and he says, Oh Mecca, Allah is my witness that you are very dear to me. I am not leaving you because you are not dear to me. But what can I do that your people have driven me out? So Allah says, وَهَمُّوا بِإِخْرَاجِ الرَّسُولِ That they drove Rasulullah out. And number three, Allah says, وَهُمْ بَدَأُوكُمْ أَوَّلَ مَرَّةً That after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, for example, the Mushrikeen are the ones who killed one of, some of the Muslimin. They are the ones who attacked you first. So why are you reluctant to defend yourself? Allah is not asking them that you go and initiate a preemptive strike. Allah says, they broke their treaties with you, they expelled the messenger, and they attacked you first. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after giving these three justifications, He asks them, أَتَخْشَوْنَهُمْ Do you fear them? Because any rational person, when you see these things happening, any rational person will find that this would be a just reason to fight. That war is justified. This is a just war. So the only reason left for you to be reluctant is that you must be afraid of them. Because there's no other valid reason for you to be opposed to military conflict. So Allah says, if you don't fight, if these reasons are not good enough for you to be motivated to go and fight and defend yourself, then you must be afraid there's a bigger problem now. Now there's an issue with your iman. Atakhshawnahum, are you afraid of them? Allah is more worthy of being feared if you are truly believers in kuntum mu'mineen. My dear brothers and sisters, you know, when we, read, when we come across verses like this, and when we engage in interfaith dialogue, there is this misconception that Islam is a, re a religion that invites people to violence. That Muslims are violent. And in contrast, Christianity is it's a religion of love. The first word that comes to mind, if you ask any person, What's the first word that comes to mind when you hear the word Christianity? They'll say love, mercy, salvation, very positive words. If you ask your average person, what comes to mind when, when the word Islam is mentioned? Many of them will say terrorism, violence, death. But the reality is, my dear brothers and sisters, to say that Christianity is a religion of peace and Islam is a religion of war, it's not accurate. In fact, 
There is no religion that can call itself a religion of peace. Why do I say that? Because there is no rational person that can, come, that can claim that peace is always the best approach under all circumstances. There's no one that's, that can say that we want peace under any circumstances, under all circumstances. As I said, peace has its prerequisites. Even if you look at Christianity itself, so you know you have you have this idea of, you know, you know, and many many times I've been to churches where the pastor or the reverend will say that we have to love our enemies. Loving your enemies, this is not a rational, this is not a logical statement. Even in the history of Christianity, you see that there were religious folks, there were religious individuals who participated in, in the Crusades. What happened to love your enemies? Because this is just a meaningless slogan. There are times when military conflict is necessary. If, if a country is invaded, if a country is invaded, do we say that we just have to love them? They're pillaging our villages. They're killing our women. They're usurping our wealth. We just have to be pacifists. Islam is a, is a logical religion. Islam is a realistic tradition. Islam doesn't say that we have to be peaceful under all circumstances. Islam says, have peace once the, the conditions are there. If you're not being oppressed, but if you're being invaded and you're being persecuted and you're being oppressed, and we cannot say that we just love our enemies and we just, everybody just lives, you know, happily ever after. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran reminds us that we cannot love his enemies. You cannot love the enemies of God. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, مَا جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لِرَجُلٍ مِّنْ قَلْبَيْنِ فِي جَوْفِ Allah has not put two hearts in a human being, in man. Meaning, you cannot love God and love Iblis. Because someone says we have to love our enemies, so you love Shaytan, you love Iblis too. You cannot claim to be a follower of Musa and say, oh, but I also love Fir'aun. You can't love Fir'aun. Yes, if you have a personal conflict, if someone hurts you on an individual level, you know, show them love, show them mercy, you pardon them, you forgive them, that's fine. But if someone is an enemy of God and they are in opposition to God and his message, you're not allowed to love them. You have to be, you have to take a stand. You have to take a decisive stand against them. So it's paradoxical to say that Islam or Christianity or any religion is a religion of peace. It's a religion of peace under certain conditions. And sometimes you have to resort to violence if it's necessary. You have to resort to military conflict if it's necessary. Even Allah Himself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not always bestowing His mercy. Allah is the loving one at times and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also what he's al muntaqim Allah punishes so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes he manifests his wrath and sometimes he manifests his grace and his mercy so you find that for someone to say that I am always peaceful I am always loving making a claim like that is basically putting yourself above God even God is not like that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even in, the, in Surah Al-Fatiha, Allah is angered by, with people. There are people that incur His wrath. If Allah loves everyone at every all times and His love is unconditional, why does Allah say in Surah Al-Fatiha, 
اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين انعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم مغضوب عليهم means do not take us away from the path of those who have incurred your wrath meaning Allah has shown people wrath he's angry with them so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is motivating the believers to fight in the Islamic tradition we don't have this concept of loving your enemies if these enemies are in opposition to God and they're killing innocent people that if they repent and Allah is forgiving but so long as they are in opposition and they are fighting the messenger of God and they are opposing the divine message we don't love them so Allah says if these reasons are not enough for you to fight then you must be afraid you must be afraid of the mushrikeen and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says if you really have Iman, you should not be afraid of anyone. You should not be afraid of death. You should not be afraid of, you know, a huge army. You should know that the one who is in full control is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is the only one who is worthy of being feared. There is no independent power other than God. You know, there's a beautiful statement from Amir al-Mu'mineen about Malik al-Ashtar. You know, Malik al-Ashtar was one of the closest companions of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen. And one of the qualities that Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib loved in Malik al-Ashtar was the fact that Malik was fearless. Malik was fearless. He, fe he truly feared no one but God. Anir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wassalam, he says, describing Malik, and Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, Kana li kama kuntu li Rasulillah, that Malik was so close to me that he, his relationship to me is like my relationship to Rasulullah. So he describes the courage and the fearlessness of Malik. He says, Law anna Malikan kharaja fi laylatin dhalma وَزَلَقَتْ رِجْلَاهُ وَدَخَلَ فِي غَابَةٍ لَيْلًا Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, if Malik al-Ashtar went out in the middle of a night, in the middle of a dark night, and he lost his way, and he ended up in a jungle, imagine, it's pitch black outside, you're alone, you wander off, and you find yourself in the middle of a jungle by yourself. وَسَحَقَتْ رِجْلَاهُ لَبْوَةً وَمَعَهَا أَشْبَالُهَا الصِّغَارِ Imam says, if Malik al-Ashr, so Imam is describing the fearlessness and the courage of Malik al-Ashr. He says, if Malik were to be walking in the middle of the night and he ended up wandering into a jungle in the middle of the night and it's pitch black and he accidentally steps on the belly of a lioness <laughs> imagine that it's pitch black you're alone in the middle of the jungle and you step on a lioness who was surrounded by her cubs and that lioness roars at him so picture the scene it's pitch black there's no one. You can't even see your hands in front of you. He's in the middle of a jungle by himself. He steps on a lioness who's very protective because she's surrounded by her cubs and the lioness roars at him. What would happen to you and I? Well, lot we would die of a heart attack at that moment. We would drop dead out of fear. Imam says, وَلَمْ يَكُنْ قَلْبُ مَالِكٍ يَتَحَرَّكُ شَعْرًا Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib doesn't exaggerate. He says, I swear that Malik's heart would not even quiver, not even a hair. He would feel nothing. He would be fearless. Where does this come from? 
This comes from Iman. Because Malik knows whether it's this animal, whether it's my enemy in the battlefield, no one can harm me without Allah's permission. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to these believers who are reluctant to fight after all of these crimes have been committed, after the treaties have been violated, after the messenger has been expelled, after they attacked you first, Allah says, Atakhshawm, are you afraid of them? I should be, I am more worthy of being feared if you are truly believers. Ayah number 14, Allah says, Qatiluhum, yu'adhibhum Allahu bi'aydikum, wa yukhzihim. وَيَمْصُرْكُمْ عَلَيْهِمْ وَيَشْفِ صُدُورَ قَوْمٍ مُؤْمِنِينَ Allah says, fight them and God will punish them by means of your hands and disgrace them and He will, he will grant you victory over them and heal the hearts of a believing people. And then I'll, I'll read ayah number 15 as well. وَيُذْهِبَ غَيْضَ قُلُوبِهِمْ وَيَتُوبُ اللَّهُ عَلَى مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ حَكِيمٌ And will dispel the rage within their hearts. God forgives whomever He wills and God is knowing and wise. So there are four concepts that are mentioned in ayah number 14 that I'd like to draw your attention to. So the command has been given to the believers to fight. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions four things in ayah number 14. Number one, he says, That Allah will punish them through your hands. Meaning, when you respond to this call, when you obey this command to fight against the leaders of disbelief, in this defensive war, you are acting as the hand of God. And we'll explain what this means. So number one, this idea of fighting and becoming the instrument of God in the battlefield. Number two, Allah says, He will disgrace them. وَيُخْزِهِمْ So, you will become the hand of God. Your enemies will be disgraced. وَيَنْصُرْكُمْ وَيَنْصُرْكُمْ عَلَيْهِمْ And Allah will support you against them. Number three. And number four. وَيَشْفِ الصُّدُورَ قَوْمٍ مُؤْمِنِينَ And Allah will heal the hearts of the mu'mineen, of the believers. Now, if you take the first concept in this verse, and that is the idea that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punishes these people through you. Now, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punishes people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout history has punished many. Sometimes Allah punishes people through natural disasters. And sometimes Allah punishes people through other people. You see, brothers and sisters, human conflict, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created this system where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has human conflict should be resolved by human beings. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to solve all of our problems. Human conflict, when there's conflict between believers and disbelievers, or believers even among themselves, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not interfere directly. He has created a system where conflict has to be resolved by people. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِقَوْمٍ حَتَّى يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِأَنفُسِهِمْ And this is a problem that, that many religious communities have throughout history. They want God to do the work for them. 
If you look at Surat Al Ma'idah, Surat Al Ma'idah, Surah number five, verse twenty-four, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala tells us about Musa and Bani Israel. Now, when Musa and Bani Israel they are released from the shackles of Pharaoh, they have other challenges. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala instructs them through Musa to go into the Holy Land and fight against the tyrants. But Bani Israel, they hesitate. They object. They say to Musa, Inna fiha qawman jabbarin. There are some powerful people in that city. There are tyrants. Anta wa rabbuka faqatila. Oh Musa, don't you say Allah is all powerful? See, the Bani Israel, they're intelligent. They're using theology to debate with Musa. They say, don't you say, isn't Allah qawi? Isn't Allah powerful? Isn't he all powerful? Isn't he omnipotent? Why don't you and your Lord go and fight them and destroy them? Why do we have to do it? It's because this is the system that Allah has created, that human conflict has to be resolved by human beings. This deen, the Sharia ah of Musa السلام, for example, was given to you. That it's for your, this Sharia ah is for your guidance. So you have to value it. That when this Sharia ah is in danger, you have to safeguard it. In the same way that you benefit from it, you benefit from the guidance of this Sharia ah of Musa, you have to become a stakeholder. You have to take ownership of this deen. Therefore, I delivered this deen to you through a human being, through Musa. And therefore, when this deen, when this sharia ah is in danger, it is upon human beings to defend it. You have to become stakeholders and shareholders. You have to take ownership. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even in Surah Al-Hajj, Surah 22, Ayah number 40, He says, Allah gives permission to the believers to fight. And he says, You have been persecuted, you have been driven out of your homes solely because you say that our Lord is God. Allah says, were it not for God's repelling people, some by means of others, monasteries, churches, synagogues, and mosques would have been destroyed. So these houses of worship, Allah says, I protected them. I repelled the enemies. And subhanAllah, look. Allah considers the churches, the synagogues, the monasteries, and the mosques to be places where God is remembered frequently. So the Muslims who are fighting in Badr, when they're given permission, they're fighting to preserve all Abrahamic institutions. That in Badr, you're not just fighting for Masajid, you're fighting for the synagogues, for the churches, you're fighting for all of these Abrahamic traditions. Because if they are preserved, these people eventually, they might make their way to Islam. So Allah is saying that I repelled them, but I did it through people. Similarly, Allah is telling the Muslims that God will punish these people through you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish the believer, these disbelievers through you, meaning through your hands. So you will become the hand of God. You are invited to become an agent of God. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيُخْزِهِمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will disgrace them. The only way that the disbelievers, these enemies, will be disgraced if you rise to the occasion. If you go and fight, if you're willing to make the sacrifice. 
They're not going to be disgraced if you stay at home. The Zionist regime, for example, they're not going to be, Allah is not going to humiliate them until the Mu'mineen unite, until they take a firm stand. So the humiliation of these individuals comes after the believers rise to the occasion and they're willing to fight. Number three, Allah says, وَيَنْصُرْكُمْ عَلَيْهِمْ Allah will support you. Meaning Allah will support you when you first take the initial step. You have to go and fight. Support will not come. You can't just stay at home and say, Oh Allah, destroy our enemies. That's not how it works. You have to go and fight. And when you do that, Allah will support you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Ali Imran, um, number, ayah number 125, Allah tells the believers, يُمْدِدْكُمْ رَبُّكُمْ Allah says, بَلَا إِن تَصْبِرُوا وَتَتَّقُوا If you are patient and you are pious, meaning if you have the patience to deal with the tribulations and the hardships of war, and you are pious, meaning that you remain obedient to the Messenger of Allah, وَيَأْتُوكُمْ مِنْ فَوْرِهِمْ هَذَا And you immediately obey the Prophet. You're not hesitant. You're not slow to answer the call of Rasulullah. Allah says, what will happen? I will support you. How? Through angels. The malaika will fortify your hearts. يُمْدِدْكُمْ رَبُّكُمْ بِخَمْسَةِ آلَافٍ مِّنَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ مُسَوِّمِينَ Allah says, I will support you with 5,000 angels. Meaning now, you see alam al ghayb there are hidden forces, forces of the unseen that are giving aid to the believers. But if the believers are not on the battlefield, how is Allah going to support them? The support comes when you show up. And then Allah says, number four, And Allah heals the hearts of the believers. There are some believers in the Muslim community their hearts were injured, meaning that they had lost loved ones. Mushrikeen, the disbelievers, had killed members of their families. They've lost their homes. They've suffered emotionally, physically. So their hearts are injured. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says that what will happen in the battlefield will heal the hearts of the believers. You know, my dear brothers and sisters, when you look at the Qur'an, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has many names. We have some ahadith that say Allah has 99 names. The hadith says, Inna lillahi tis'an wa tis'ina isma man ahsaha dakhla al-jannah. There's a hadith from the Holy Prophet that says Allah has 99 names. If you are able to enumerate them, you will enter paradise. There are other traditions say that no, Allah has 999 names. You know, if you look at Dua Joshan, for example, there are more than 99 names that are mentioned. Now, there's a discussion among the, the ulama of kalam, the theologians, and they say that are we allowed to attribute names to God? So other than the 99 names, can we call upon Allah with other than those 99 names. Now, there are some ulama that say Allah's names are infinite. He has only revealed 99 formal names and maybe a thousand names that are extracted from the Quran. So we are allowed to call upon Allah using names that are mentioned in ahadith and even names that refer to certain actions that Allah ascribes to himself in the Quran. So Allah describes himself as being the healer of the hearts of the believers. So you can call upon Allah saying, Ya Shafi Sudur al Mu'mini, Oh, the one who heals the hearts of the believers. If you go to the next verse, Allah describes himself as being the one 
who dispels the rage that's in the heart of the believers. All the one who removes the rage from the hearts of the believers. Now, the names of Allah refer to Allah's actions that are always taking place. Allah is always healing the hearts. He's always removing rage from the, the hearts of the mu'mini. And therefore you find that look at how precious the heart of the believer is. That one of the objectives of this conflict is what? To heal the hearts of the mu'mini. That look at how important Allah makes it a point that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in addition to doing all of the things that He will do, that He will support, that He will give victory, that He will disgrace the disbelievers, that you will be the hand of God, that Allah will heal the hearts of the believers. This shows you that the heart of a mu'min is so sacred. We have to be very careful not to injure the hearts of mu'mineen. Because Allah has designed the universe in a way that the heart of a believer will be healed if it is injured. Whether it's through military conflict, whether it's through some type of loss that happens to their enemies or those who cause them injury. That's why we have to be very careful not to hurt or to injure the hearts of the believers. There's a hadith. There's a, actually an Arab proverb, Arabic proverb that says, sinan The injuries that is caught, the wounds that are caused by a spear or the swords, they can eventually heal. But the injury, the wound that is caused by the tongue, can never be healed. You know, when you say something, you know, someone might forgive you, but they will not forget. The damage is done. There's a hadith from the Holy Prophet وآله, where he says, Man ahana li waliyan. There's a hadith Qudsi. The Holy Prophet narrates from God, from Allah, where Allah says, Man ahana li waliyan faqad arsada li muharabati. That whoever insults a believer, Whoever humiliates a believer, he has declared war on me. Allah says, you are declaring war on me when you injure the heart of the believer. In another hadith from the Holy Prophet, the hadith says that Rasulullah was looking at the, the Kaaba. And he says to the Kaaba, Ma atiyabaki wa atiyabarihuki. How pleasant are you? And how pleasant is your fragrance? Rasulullah is addressing Kaaba. Ma a'zamaki wa a'zama hurmatuki. That how sacred are you, O Kaaba? And then the Prophet he says, Walladi nafsu Muhammadin biyadi. I swear by the one in whom the soul of Muhammad is in his hand. He's swearing by Allah. La hurmatul mu'min. He says, I swear by Allah, he addresses the Kaaba, that the honor of a mu'min, the sanctity of a mu'min, is even greater than your sanctity. What did Allah do to those who came, who tried to destroy the Kaaba? What did Allah do to Ashab al fil Allah destroyed them. Allah obliterated them. If this is the punishment for someone, who destroys Kaaba? What is the punishment for someone who damages the heart of a mu'min? So Allah says that one of the one of the objectives, one of the things that He will do in this battle and this war is that He will heal the hearts of the believers and He will remove the rage that is within their hearts because Allah Subhanahu wa Taala cares about the heart of the believer. He doesn't want them to be agitated. He doesn't want them, their hearts to be injured. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a hadith Qudsi, He says, لا يسعني أرضي ولا سماي, That I am not contained by the heavens, nor am I contained by the earth. But rather, وَلَكِنْ يَسَعُنِي 
The only thing that contains me is the heart of a believer. And therefore, this heart of a believer is very sacred. And one of the objectives of, of these this conflict, according to these verses, that is that Allah wants to heal the hearts of the mu'mineen. If you look at ayah number 15, notice that it seems that whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is, you know, trying to mobilize the believers to fight, He's trying to motivate them, those who are reluctant, there's always this mentioning is of, of وَيَتُوبُ اللَّهُ عَلَى مَنْ يَشَاءُ the door of Tawbah is always being mentioned. That even though we're in the heat of battle, Allah is encouraging the believers to fight and He will support you and He, he will humiliate the your enemies. But Allah says that if, if someone wants Tawbah, Allah is so forgiving. That even if this mushrik fought you for days in the battlefield and he has caused you damage, if he sincerely, if he repents, then you have to consider him your brother in faith now. You have you can't hold, hold a grudge anymore. So you see that even when we're talking about war and conflict and battle, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always tempers this discussion with, but if they repent, Allah is the acceptor of repentance. So it's it's important for us to always keep this balance. That that we don't have this, you know, this attitude that we're going to destroy the enemies, no mercy, we don't take prisoners, we just destroy them all. No, Allah says if they repent, you accept them as your brothers and you don't even hold a grudge against them. That al Islam yajubbu ma qabla. Islam washes away the past. So I just wanted to make this point.